Welcome everybody to our uh, Tuesday afternoon hearing for the uh, House Energy and Technology Committee. Um, today we're going to continue our work on um, budget requests that have come before the Appropriations Committee that to some extent fall in the purview of this committee. Um, we have a couple of witnesses joining us today um, uh, to speak to uh, a, a perspective appropriation on um, a funding study for public access television in the state of Vermont. Um, this is uh, a request that came out of a legislative study committee that mes met uh, last summer and was chaired by Senator Ballant and um, Representative Yantoshka from our committee was on that committee as well. Um, Lauren Glenn Davidian is joining us. I believe that um, she served on that committee and um, also has done a, a a lot of work with uh, the two dozen plus um, public access television stations around the state. Um, this appropriation was something that was not in H966 earlier this year, but there was language in that bill that said we would be funding this. Um, I think the funding uh, stipulation in H966 said that it would be funded by ACCD, but I think the um, expectation was that we would find um, funding for that um, in the coming months. So that is laying out there right now and wanted to make sure we had a chance to hear from Senator Ballant as well as Lauren Glenn to um, hear about the work that they've done and some of the support from this. Um, I would also, as members are listening to the testimony, um, might refer you to um, looking at language in Bill S-318, which was a bill introduced, I can't remember if it was last year or this year, I think it was this year, um, which um, speaks to this funding request in, in some detail. But with that, by way of introduction, um, I wanna make sure we get Senator Ballant in right now because I know that the Senate Finance Committee, I believe is meeting soon and I wanna make sure she has a chance to get there. So. Um, thank you, Senator Ballant, for joining us this uh, afternoon, and welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the invitation. I know that uh, Lauren Glenn will be able to fill in a lot of the, the details, since this really is her bailiwick. I think the most important thing for you all to know is that uh, Representative Yantachka and I both feel really strongly that even before the pandemic hit, these public access stations are critical for Vermonters. Um, many of our communities across the state, especially our elderly residents, get a lot of their news about local government from these public access uh, TV stations. And we wanna make sure that as the funding stream changes, as more and more people uh, do cord cutting and they're not, there isn't as much uh, revenue coming from uh, the agreement that we have with Comcast, that we want to make sure that long term there is a way for these folks to stay viable. And I think probably everyone in your committee can speak to how it plays out in, in their own communities. But we just heard from, you know, across the state constituents and many members of the community who either have shows on public access or regularly frequent shows, select board members. Um, uh, development review boards, everything that is the work of town and local government and state government, people feel like they get so much of that access from uh, public access TV. And we just feel like, although uh, it, it hasn't been a place in which we have offered funding in the past, we do feel like um, it is work that we want to see it continue. And it's just been highlighted so much by the situation we're in uh, with COVID-19 and people being homebound. And so it's, it's completely accentuating that problem. So we looked at a bunch of different possibilities within the scope of our committee. There were only, uh, I believe six meetings plus a public hearing. It did not allow enough time to really dig into the details of what was possible that didn't run afoul of state or, or federal law around these issues. And we felt like we needed more expertise uh, connected to uh, right of way connected to um, our, our communications um, providers. And we just didn't have the time within the scope of the summer to do that. But we felt like it's a place where we need to spend some money to get an expert in to do that consulting for us. So that's why we are where we are. We couldn't come to an agreement 
within the study committee about what that appropriation should be. And a lot, most of that was for uh, political reasons, but we got a, 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 an assessment from joint fiscal about what it would cost to do this, this scope of research. And that's how we landed on this, this figure. And Lauren Glenn can speak more specifically about all the different details that this um, person or, or people would be looking at to help us figure this out, so. Um, just, just a quick question for you, Senator. Um, in terms of uh, S318, a bill that you had introduced, I think with Senator Campion, I'm certainly not gonna ask you to take, take us through that bill, but um, would you say some of the work in that bill reflects uh, essentially the need for and um, yes. you know, kind of it reflects your request and interest for Absolutely. what this money would be used yes. for? Yes, that is a fair assessment. Yes. Okay. And th the reason I ask that is also um, if this committee chooses to be supportive in a recommendation to the Appropriations Committee on this, um, we would likely look to um, Representative Feltis to perhaps use some language from that bill or uh, from the bill we passed earlier this year, H966, uh, mm -hmm. the CRF money bill, yeah. um, to reflect specifically what that money would be used for. I, I hate to leave. Um, I hate to leave it to chance Absolutely. as to how this money would be spent. Uh, and we want. I think we want to be as specific as possible to make sure that if we do make this recommendation it meets the needs of the study committee that had looked at this, right. so. Absolutely, that makes good sense. Okay, um, you know, while we have the advantage of, of having uh, Senator Ballin here, I just wanna see if there's any questions for her. I see that um, Representative Campbell um, has his hand up. You wanna go ahead, Scott? Yes, thank you, Tim. Um, Senator Ballin, I'm wondering if, if there were any changes that we should think about uh, to S, 318, um, any, any, anything different that, sh, that you discovered in the course of the, the study committee that we, should, that we should be thinking about? Scott, you know, nothing comes to mind right now. And as, as you can imagine, my head is in a lot of, of different places right now. But, <laughs> yes. but it's yeah. a great question. And I um, let me commit to you that I will do a deeper dive on that language and circle back around with your chair to answer that question. Because okay. I, I don't want to... I don't want to say definitively that there's not. I just want a little bit more time. Great. Thank, Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands up. And just um, uh, so thank you, uh, Senator Absolutely. Ballin, for joining us. I really appreciate you taking a few minutes and um, just, you know, giving a little background on your, your uh, the, the study committee that you chaired. And also, again, welcome any more feedback you want to give. Uh, um, to me directly, and I would certainly share that with my committee. So thank you for joining us. Um, and good luck in Senate Finance today. We'll actually probably be listening to some of that discussion as well, since it affects the work of this committee. So thanks for that work as well. And you know, thanks um, again for, while I have you all here, thanks again for all the work that your committee did on the broadband bill, because you did the, you did the heavy lift. And I just, as a Senator coming over to your committee, I want you to know we, absolutely on the Senate side, appreciate the work that you did. So thank you. So thank you for that. And while Senator Ballin is running downstairs to get back to Senate finance, um, I just wanna ask Danielle, could you make me a co-host of this meeting so that I can manage the, um, the uh, hands that, that go up and down? Um, that would be helpful. And with that, I wanna um, turn the mic over to Lauren Glenn. And thank you for joining us. Um, You've, uh, I, my recollection, it was, I think it was June when you were last with us to speak to some of the um, needs around uh, the PEG community. And um, we had supported, uh, you know, the, the two dozen plus uh, public access television stations around Vermont with some coronavirus relief money. Um, We'd love to hear about how that is going today, um, although that's not the reason you're here. Um, but, uh, you know, if you have some, uh, you know, specific or anecdotal information and we have time for that, we'd love to hear about that. Um, but again, thanks for joining us today to speak to this appropriation request for the study group. Was I correct in saying that you were part of that study committee? Um, when I, okay, so good. Um, so thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us and, and welcome. 
Thank you so much. It's just a pleasure to see all of you virtually. I'm Lauren Glendavidian. I'm the executive director of CCTV Center for Media and Democracy, which is based in Burlington. And I also represent Vermont Access Network, which as you know, is a network of 25 community media centers that service across the state. Um, just to start, we are incredibly grateful for the allocation of $466,500 that was in H966, section 18. Um, this has proven to be incredibly valuable for all of our members. I've been the primary administrator of the, um, the billing for that. We have put together the first set of bills through the 30th of June. That amounts to about 55% of those funds. So um, anywhere from helping access or helping municipalities make the switch to virtual platform and getting them live onto YouTube to helping to manage graduations. As you know, graduations were mostly virtual, but they were produced largely with the support of community media centers producing B-roll and pre-recorded materials and then editing it all together so that these could be seen at, um, you know, in, in drive-in movie, like people in cars doing the graduation or watching at home. So the access centers and have been in partnership with community institutions, um, also providing educational materials for people of many ages, and of course, emergency um, information regarding, regarding the COVID health emergency. So the access centers have been incredibly busy and we have been diligent in our record keeping. So we're about to submit a bill to the Department of Public Service for, as I said, about 55% of those funds. Um, we will do another billing cycle through the end of September, which I think should account for most of it. And any of the funds that are left for the access centers that are too small to spend it all at once, um, we'll do a third funding um, collection for the 30th of November. So we expect to spend that money down and it is deeply appreciated. And I have a report that I will send you, a one, two pager that I meant to send yesterday, but I will send you that gives you a nice overview of the things that we've been doing across the state. So that was um, deeply appreciated, your thoughtfulness to include us in that package. Um, thank you, Rep. Sibilia and Briglin and members of the committee on helping with that. Any questions on that? Should I keep going? Um, why don't you keep going? Uh, you know, that is definitely something that we'll um, probably come back to in the coming weeks as we review, you know, just how all the Sierra funding is going. But um, since we want to focus on the, you know, the current budget, um, why don't we move on to, um, to this, this study request? So um, in the final hours of the H9966, Senator Kitchell um, included Section 19, because I think we had um, harangued her so much about this PEG study. Um, she, and she was quite supportive as were your committee and other, the Senate Finance. I mean, I think there's general support for this study as Senator Ballant outlined. Um, and ACCD looked at it with due diligence and determined that it was not eligible for COVID funds and therefore included it in the governor's version of the F21 budget, which Again, we're very grateful for that support. So what I, I did want to underscore um, were what the important parts of that study are and, um, and where the emphasis we think is important to lie. I would agree that S318 um, does spell that out pretty clearly. Um, we could pick apart parts of S318 if you want. There's a section on Vermont Interactive TV um, in that bill that buildings and grounds or that's not exactly their name, I'm sorry, but it's the, the big administrative agency is supposed to be looking at that may or may not be practical. But um, the elements of S318, I'm gonna just emphasize for you what's important. Um, they are included in the language that is in H966, but perhaps not as explicit as might be, um, as might be useful for uh, the consultants. So the central purpose of the PEG study is to assess the communications providers use of the public rights of way in order to determine whether and to what extent these services may generate fees or rights of way assessments that don't come into conflict with federal law. So as you know, the feds 
have um, tied the state's hands in terms of broadband tax. And um, we need to look at examples around the country to determine how we might be able to uh, sidestep federal preemption of broadband taxes and look at broader, uh, more broad-based assessments, and in particular, the right-of-ways <clears throat> and how the commercial use of what essentially are public rights of way may be a revenue generator for not only PEG access, I would just like to point out, but possibly for the state and other public benefits. We don't know how much revenue this could generate, which is partly why we need a financial assessment as well as a legal assessment. And that would give us some good information about how this may benefit um, the work we do and possibly a broader brief. So the assessment, as I said, would include examples from other jurisdictions um, we've seen in the study committee that there are entertainment taxes, obviously there are cloud taxes, there are telecommunications fees. Um, we haven't found an, a pretty a clear example of how right-of-way assessments would be structured. So that's why we need some more research, again, from someone who has some legal, telecommunications legal experience. And ideally, the result would be financial models and policy recommendations that would give us revenue projections and also policy framework in which to think about this going forward. And then the secondary purpose of the study is to conduct a business assessment of PEG access management organizations to see if we can operate more efficiently and effectively. I just like to point out, we are as Vermont Access Network actively engaged in that effort. Um, and certainly we could benefit from some business planning um, help in that area. Um, and I would say that the telecommunications legal assessment, policy recommendations, financial assessment is the priority and the, um, the, the possible support of business planning, which was very important to the department and to Comcast um, could continue to be included in that bill. And I would say that given the work we are doing in this realm, that would be a secondary goal of the bill. Um, Lauren Glenn, uh, I don't want to lead the witness here, but um, it would be helpful for me if um, we, or if you would lay out for the committee, actually I'll say for me, uh, I'm sure there's folks on our committee who understand this full well, um, but kind of what the problem is, if you will. And um, just at a very high level, my understanding of the challenge that is being faced by um, by by PEG, uh, you know, community access television, is that it is currently supported, uh, at least in Vermont. I'm not sure if it's nationally, but in Vermont, it's supported by a fee on uh, cable television bills that is paid. And the conglomeration of those fees essentially is the funding source for PEG stations. As folks have started to move away from cable television as their source for, um, com let's say, commercial television, uh, that is a revenue source has gone down in terms of its support for, for PEG. And um, that's what's essentially set the, the financial bind you're in, in motion. I know there's some other things, but can you give our committee just kind of a sense as to what's created the challenge? And then, you know, that will, I think, give more context also as to why, you know, studying a new path or an additional path um, would be helpful. Certainly, thank you. Um, we've been concerned about the erosion of cable franchise fees since 1990, when the phone companies got into the video business. So this has been a long time coming that um, ha was hastened by fiber and the ability for Comcast to send not only video to your home in the form of a cable service, but broadband to your home in the form of internet service. Comcast is a good example, although there are, I think now six cable companies in the state, but they are the biggest. Comcast uses the same fiber to send cable to your home and internet to your home, but the regulatory framework for cable and internet are different. The 
Communications Act of 1934, which was updated many times. Franchise fees on cable service track to cable revenue and have been on a slow decline, which has accelerated in some parts of Vermont. In some parts of Vermont, they're stable right now, but we're expecting that they will decline as people cut the cord and move to entertainment and news and communications using the internet rather than cable because they don't have to get all the channels on the cable system. So this erosion of cable franchise fees, the policy is no longer going to serve the purpose of the public benefit in exchange for using the public rights of way to string a cable. Now, the access centers in Vermont have multiple sources of revenue now because they have started over the past 10 years in particular to diversify. So BCTV in Brattleboro is a very good example. They combine memberships, fees for production services, underwriting, as well as cable franchise fees. And we have a good chart that I can share with you that shows this diversity of revenue. Um, it's not like we've all been, I know you know this, but we haven't been sitting around just wringing our hands. We've been trying to create some revenue diversity. But the fact is that the cable franchise fees are the biggest chunk of money. Is, the, is that a Vermont policy? Um, do uh, cable franchise fees support public access television in other states as well? Is that a national policy or is that something unique to Vermont that was set up in Vermont decades ago? It's unique to the franchise authority, which in some states are states and in some states are municipalities. And so a municipality quite often would collect the cable franchise fees and just put it into their general fund. So there are about a thousand access centers around this country, but there are many, many more franchising authorities collecting cable franchise fees. So it's the discretion of the franchising authority and in Vermont, because we had a statewide franchising authority in the mid eighties, when we really started this advocacy work, um, we were able to create a uniform policy that was then codified in what's known as rule eight in the statutes. So, so Vermont is very much um, a model for the rest of the country, but it depends on the nature of the franchising authority and their goals. I would add something I think that's important, which is why this, while our pants are on fire, they're not as on fire as they might be. Um, Comcast won't sell you internet without selling you cable. So Comcast has figured out a way to keep as much business as possible. Burlington Telecom will sell you just internet. You don't have to buy cable. You can just buy one of the triple play that they offer voice data and video. So Comcast is, has a business strategy to keep as many cable customers as they can, which is why the decline has not been as fast or precipitous as we thought it might be. All of this is to say that now is actually a good time for us to do a study in this because we are seeing an erosion. I mean, in our center, we've probably lost the equivalent of a staff person in the past two years of revenue, but in the rural parts of Vermont where cable is being built out, their revenue loss has been less than that. But it's a good time to do this study because we would study it and then we would talk about policy recommendations and this might take one or two years for us to put something into effect if the legislature chose to do that. So I would see a scenario where you have cable franchise fees, but you also have another revenue source and that one starts to supplant the other as really the cable business ultimately collapses into the broadband business. And again, as you pointed out my final point, the federal feds in the form of the FCC have tied the hands of uh, states and municipalities and said, we want unfettered internet. We don't want to put any, we don't want to hamper the internet business. Therefore, you can't pass any rules that just single out broadband for special taxes. So any policy we come up with needs to be a, a more broad based look at the use of rights of way that don't just single out the broadband users. Thank you for that background. That, that was certainly helpful to me. 
Um, Lauren Glenn, we've got a couple of hands up if you don't mind taking some questions at this point. Um, first Representative Chase and then Representative Campbell. Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. And uh, there is a little bit of irony here. I am currently on Comcast, which means uh, that when I couldn't quite hear what you were saying, that's entirely on them. Um, I, I thought you were here. Uh, I heard. Yeah, sorry. I thought I heard you say that uh, Comcast doesn't sell internet without cable, and I was hoping for clarification on that point because I think my personal experience speaks otherwise. Oh, that may be. Um, my understanding is that they package the internet with the cable. And so I'm not sure we should get them to verify that. But that was my understanding of how they structured their packaging in Vermont. Okay. Uh, that, uh, if I could request a, additional clarification on that if for you know the, the state as a whole, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Scott. That was my question too. I, 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 I wondered, so cable is regulated by, by at the state level by the, by the cable, what did, what did you, what did you call this? The cable regulatory authority or something like that? Well, in Vermont, it's regulated by the PUC, not prices, okay. but conditions of their certificate of public good. Right. Well, so uh, presumably the PUC is allowing uh, Comcast or whoever it is to package to require people to, to, to buy cable video as well as, as in, in order to get internet, that's what I'm trying to say? No, the PC has no jurisdiction over the packaging or the pricing. They only have jurisdiction over the use of the rights of way and line extensions and peg access. So um, we should get Comcast in because I, I have been trying to figure out the revenue numbers and the trends in the state and from my colleagues, um, they reported to me because I don't have Comcast that this is how it's packaged. And that actually helped make it make a little bit more sense that we're not seeing the dramatic revenue declines that we anticipated. But we are seeing a steady erosion, but not a big drop at this time. Hmm. So let's find out from Comcast how they package it. But just to clarify, Representative Campbell, the PUC does not have jurisdiction over how they package their or price. Service. They lost regulation over price in the 80s. Interesting. All right. Thank you. Yep. Um, so I don't see any other hands up. Um, Lauren Glenn, I'm not sure if we interrupted your testimony with, with questions, if there's more you'd like to add or. Um, no, I not. think um, I, I think that concludes it. Um, we were I just wanted to underscore that we were very grateful to Senator Kitchell um, and her committee for including this in H966. Um, and I think if we have the opportunity to uh, emphasize what the primary goal is in this next, in this FY21 budget, we have a little bit more time than she did when she put it into that bill, which was, uh, you know, in the final hours. So, um, and to, to, so thank you for that um, clarification as well. Um, what, uh, what my committee, what the task before our committee, uh, I think, is to consider um, a handful of funding recommendations that are in the governor's budget that um, are coming before the Appropriations Committee that kind of fall into the uh, bailiwick of this committee. Um, I would say that this proposal in the governor's budget is really kind of on the edge of our committee. Um, it's a proposal that is, uh, if adopted, would be funded through the Agency of uh, Commerce and Community Development, which is not really the purview of our committee. Um, but we have done some work um, in support of PEGS in the past, so I think that's why it, it fell to us to make that recommendation or not. Um, so that's something we'll be discussing. Um, if there Aren't any more questions for Lauren Glenn? Uh, again, I want to thank you for joining us today and giving us some background on this. Um, you're welcome to stick around if you want or, or uh, listen online. Um, for committee members, we are going to spend the rest of our time today, uh, as I had just given a brief introduction to, um, discussing some of the um, kind of line item parts of the budget that fall within our committee's purview. And I'd like to turn to that now. Um, okay. Can I interrupt and just ask one question? Sure. 
Yes, if, please. Would it be useful for us to pull out S318 language or um, compare it what the current language is? Do you have a thought on that? What would be useful to the committee to sort of yeah. make it so I'll, I'll, you? Yep, um, and again, you know, our discussion in the next uh, hour and a half or so, I think will evidence where support is for different funding proposals. And obviously, um, uh, I'm sure that the Appropriations Committee is going to get recommendations from policy committees that uh, exceed the amount of money uh, that they have to appropriate. But um, I think it would be helpful um, if you, uh, and again, working with, with Senator Ballant, um, might look at S318. Um, and if there are pieces of that bill that give direction to um, focusing uh, ACCD and how this money might be used um, with the very specific criteria that we want to accomplish in this study, um, I think that would be helpful. I mean, you certainly highlighted the, you know, the two major things, which is, again, kind of an assessment of um, the current franchise fee revenue stream and how that might evolve or devolve in the future. So primarily, this is a funding study, um, as, the, as the legislation says. But it's also an opportunity, I think, um, that you characterize this kind of a business assessment. Um, how does the business model for PEG uh, channels change going forward? Um, and that obviously is wrapped up in the revenue model as well. So personally, I would welcome that language. And I suspect the Appropriations Committee would as well. Um, out of 318 and also looking at what Senator Kitchell had put into H966. Um, if there are recommendations you can make there, I think that would be helpful. Um, and again, we'll see where the, where the cookie crumbles in terms of the recommendations of this committee and ultimately House Appropriations as they kind of have the final word um, from our side of the building. Well, thank you. I will uh, follow up with Senator Balin. Thank you. Yep. Great, thanks. thanks for being here, Lauren Glenn. Um, so, you know, as I said, I, I'd, I'd like to um, turn the committee's attention now really to committee discussion. And I will lay out uh, kind of an outline if people want to make notes on this. Um, I don't have a document to share, um, but I have a list of, uh, I believe it's five things that um, we have discussed in recent days, including this, uh, this afternoon, um, things that you know, I think we want to make a recommendation or not to the Appropriations Committee. Um, and I will just say as a footnote to that, that it's, it's likely that in the coming days, um, we are gonna be called upon to make recommendations to the Joint Fiscal Committee, uh, not the appropriate, well, yeah, now I'll say not the Appropriations Committee, on some requests that have been made of the Joint Fiscal Committee in terms of additional CRF funding that would fall into um, kind of the bailiwick of our committee. One of those we'd heard about last week, which was um, Secretary Quinn being in to talk about a $5 million request for um, uh, a modernization of the HR um, software that basically um, uh, manages uh, the, the state's human resources system. That was a request we'd heard about uh, two or three months ago. That request has gone to the Joint Fiscal Committee. I'm anticipating that the Joint Fiscal Committee is gonna be asking us for a recommendation on that. So that's a footnote, that's not today. I'm just giving you a heads up on what might be coming down the path. So um, the, the uh, I think it is five things that I have on my list of things to um, make recommendations to the Appropriations Committee on um, one we've just discussed, which is um, in the governor's budget, there is a $100,000 request of one-time money, um, and it is general fund money, to uh, support a PEG study. That's a study that would be, uh, be conducted through um, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. That study is going to be done. Uh, according to language in H966. It's going to be done by ACCD, whether we fund it or not. So if we fund it in this budget, that frees up $100,000 or whatever it will cost for ACCD to do other work. If we don't fund it in this budget, 
Um, there still is language in statute that says that ACCD has to do this work. Um, so that is one uh, request that we have to discuss. Uh, a second request is um, there is a request of $300,000 for telecom planning. And again, this is one-time money in the governor's budget. Um, to support um, kind of the conclusion, if you will, of telecom planning. And I'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to this um, discussion item, because I think there's a lot of history to talk through from our committee's perspective um, and the effect that this will have on the budget and how we've supported this in H966. But a second item I want to go through is $300,000 of uh, one-time money general fund money um, for telecom planning. Uh, a third item, and we talked about this a little bit last week with Commissioner Tierney, is uh, a request in the governor's budget for $125,000 for Wi-Fi hotspots. And that is something that, um, well, again, we can get into that a little deeper. Um, there's more background I wanna remind the committee on um, with regard to that, um, but that's a third item. Um, a fourth item in the governor's budget is a request for $2 million of one-time money um, to support funding grants for CUDs. And this is essentially equity financing, if you will, um, to support CUDs as they draw down debt financing, um, primarily at VITA, but I think it could potentially support um, CUD borrowing uh, from other places as well. Um, so that's a fourth issue. And then a fifth issue, which is really peripheral to our committee's work, but it was something that we heard a little bit about on Friday and um, uh, it you know, kind of falls on the border between the Agency of Digital Services and uh, VTRANS um, or, or the Department of Motor Vehicles. And that is a $1.2 million request in the governor's budget again, one-time money um, for modernization of um, the DMV's uh, stickering program. And uh, we can talk a little bit about that. You know, I think that the fundamental request um, for feedback on that program basically went to the Transportation Committee and I've been in contact with them and I'll share that with the committee as well when we um, discuss that item. So those are the five things that I have um, on my plate that uh, with as much um, alacrity as possible. I'd like to have our committee give feedback to, um, to Representative Feltus and the Appropriations Committee. In the past, we've done this in the form of a formal letter. Um, what the Appropriations Chair has said to me is, you know, you, you don't need to bring legislative counsel in to do this. Um, get your committee's feedback put it in an email and send it to my committee, which is how I intend to do this. So we're not gonna go through the more formal process that we um, tend to. So before we dive into these individual items, um, Mark, I see your hand up, uh, you know, go ahead. No, you said before we dive into these. So did you wanna say something else before we dive into these or? No, I, I just wanted to set the table as the, you know, kind of those five items. Those are the things we're going to go through today. And um, if we're able to come to uh, recommendations to the Appropriations Committee, that, that's, that is entirely what my agenda is for the next hour and a half. Okay. Um, if I could ask a question first. Sure. Um, under the $100,000 for the uh, PEG study, um, is that just part of the $466,500 that they were talking about, or is that something different? It is not, uh, it is something different. And um, I don't, you know, since you brought it up, Mark, why don't we take that one first? Um, and so uh, let's turn to that. Um, I've got another computer screen up and I'm gonna bring some of this information up, but uh, I'll refresh members with um, language that was in, um, H4, or excuse me, H966. Um, in section 19 of that bill, um, what you're referring to, Mark, was the $466,500 that was um, part of coronavirus relief funding 
that was uh, is being used on an emergency basis to support work done by PEG stations, basically for additional expenses they've taken on because of COVID. Um, and we've kind of discussed that um, ad infinitum. Also um, included in that part of the bill, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm flipping to it right now. Um, I beg your pardon, the, the funding was in section 18. In section 19, um, and this was language that was added by the Senate, um, it specified that ACCD shall retain a consultant to review the current business model for PEGS um, and provide recommendations concerning how to ensure the future financial, financial viability and viability of PEG channels. And there's a little more language in there, but basically there's language in H966 that says the ACCD is going to do this work, but there was no funding in there because it was determined that um, funding for that work was not CRF uh, eligible. So the way I view this now is we have said we're gonna do this work. We simply haven't said how we're gonna fund it. And uh, I think the, the, um, the administration's reaction to that was, okay, we're gonna put this money in the budget um, to go to ACCD to support this work. In short, I think that's what's happened. So Scott, I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mark. No, I guess just so initially talking about ACCD shall, um, what what was their thinking about? I mean, it would just come out of out of that their particular budget or whatever they use for money, uh, regardless. I mean, that's they'd have to prioritize other things. That is my reading of this. Okay. That um, that statutorily in H nine sixty six we said ACCD, you're going to do the study. Um, conveniently, there was no funding put in there. I mean, this is a classic okay. unfunded mandate. Um, you know, the governor in his budget has said, okay, here's how we're going to fund it. And again, I think if, if through this budgetary process in the next two or three weeks, we decide not to fund this, it's going to come out of ACCD budgets. You know, it's going to come at the expense of something else, essentially. Okay. That's how I read it. Thanks. Yep. Scott? Uh, Mark asked my questions, I think. <laughs> I, had, I had the same, same questions. What, what happens if we don't fund this? In, in, in this budget, um, it still has to be done. So, but I think you answered it. Yeah, I mean, by, by my ready, reading of the statute, yeah, I think it's, it's clear that it has to be done. Uh, Robin? So uh, you said that initially they determined that the uh, CRF funds were not, it was not an eligible use. So what we're looking at here is not CRF funds, but general fund money. That, that is correct. And I'm just going to pull up my um, governor's budget presentation to confirm that. Yes, um, this is in section B1100 in the governor's budget. And it's um, under one time general fund appropriations, $100,000 to ACCD to hire a consultant. Yep. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions on this um, on this funding study? Yes, um, I'm just. I, I think what would be helpful for me is a general. I w we know that funding requests will be much greater than the amount of money available, and I'm just wondering if, uh, and perhaps we're not ready to do that yet, but. If we can kind of prioritize these rather than yes or no, where they are on the ranking. I, I think that's a very fair um, request. And, and maybe um, the best way to handle uh, going through this process is let's discuss each of, the, each of these items. And just as a preview, there are some of the things that, um, some of these five things that I've mentioned that I have ideas that we might um, share with the appropriations committee that would give them more flexibility in how to fund these things. Mm -hmm. um, some of which I've previewed with uh, Representative Feltis and uh, the appropriations chair. Um, so I, I think it's a good point, Robin. Um, why don't we discuss each of these things? 
I'd ask members to kind of take notes on them and then let's come back and discuss them in total so that we're not um, just you know, putting money towards something that you know, maybe ultimately would be at the expense of another program. I think that's helpful. Um, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, uh, to go a little further with Robin's assessment of what we should be doing, <clears throat> I even look at this a little, little further along and you know, we're in a silo here looking at our priorities for you know, these three or four programs. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna even go further and say, you know, there's a $23.8 million non-funded bridge for the state colleges right now. And to me, I have to look, or at least, you know, whether or not my input or decision or whatever gets to the far reaches, but uh, I, I'm looking at that as one of the top priorities um, so when I look at some of these other things, I say, hey, wait a minute, you know, how, how long has this been in play? Uh, is it really a huge priority? Um, you know, this is all money. I mean, I can add up, uh, you know, another $2.3 million to go to the, to the uh, uh, state colleges right now. Um, you know, we've got to start doing things like that if we are looking for this money um, and not hoping that it magically appears from the feds. So. Uh, again, that's 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 how I'm looking at some of this. I know, you know, politically you'd get blasted no matter uh, what you did if you said, "Hey, you know, I don't I don't like the uh, the two million dollar funding for going to the CUDS." But uh, you know, again, I think I mentioned this the other day. We've we've reached out and started this a new program, and there's Vita funding. There's um, you know an extra charge on our phone bills. There's legislation we did to get them going. So uh, I guess, where does it stop? And we've got uh, previous commitments for generations and um, that's that's where I come down with a lot of this stuff. I'm outside the silo of the uh, energy committee. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that, Mark. Um, and you know, when you mentioned state colleges, that is a critical area to my immediate area. Um, so that's a, that's a soft spot in my heart. You know, at, at the end of the day, I'm glad I'm not on the appropriations committee. Um, I think we have to give them our best thoughts on these programs. Um, and again, I will share with the committee, you know, some conversations on some of these um, five programs where, uh, you know, again, I'll put forward for the committee's um, thoughts on giving the appropriations committee more flexibility. Um, maybe there are different places that can be gone for funding. So I, I think that's, you know, to your point where we can certainly be helpful. Um, you know, and, and maybe we prioritize, you know, these five things, um, you know, top to bottom. Again, that's why maybe it's important to discuss all of them in full and then come back and, and kind of get feedback uh, from members on these. So, um, uh, Heidi, did you want to chime in? I, I, um, I just wanted to actually echo uh, Mark's comments um, of, I'm, I'm really looking to, um, uh, really keep up to date on what is happening in the Appropriations Committee with regard to the decisions overall. And uh, and so I'm not quite sure. And um, I, I, I know, obviously, we don't have, you know, we have to do these, these things quickly, but um, I'm hopeful that I'll have um, more information on or, you know, on where they're on where they're heading uh, with regard to the Appropriations Committee. But I'm looking at it in a much more um, universal way than just our committee. So I just want to echo Mark's Mark's comments. Okay. Um, well, again, I want to direct us to what the Appropriations Committee has asked us for recommendations on. Um, we've talked a little bit about the PEG study and the background on that and why that is on our plate. Uh, go ahead, Laura. Did you want to speak to that? I don't want to interrupt you. I'm ready to no, weigh in now. Yep, go ahead. Um, you know, I think. Uh, we're all moving really quickly here on a three quarters of a year budget. This is not our normal process. So I'm hearing and I share um, the concerns that Mark and Heidi are putting forward around wanting to understand kind of the big picture and wanting to keep an eye on that. Um, it is, I mean, we do roll things up um, via committees. Um, I like Robin's idea of prioritizing. I think that makes a lot of sense um, for our committee. Um, 
and you know in that regard uh the <clears throat> to the surprise of no one um i will say i think this two million dollars for the cuds is imperative um i think we can't forget what we have done um with regard to the cud what this committee has done we've told uh, Vermonters that no one is coming to save them, that um, the situation is getting worse, and that it really is up to them. No one's coming to save them, including the state of Vermont. Two million dollars is not going to get the job done. Um, what it's going to do is leverage uh, the additional VITA dollars, and it's going to allow the CUDs to move forward. Mr. Chair, I think you have some of the CUDs scheduled for later this week. Um, you know, I've been able to keep in good touch with them. I think most of our committee members have kept in touch with them. Um, they are getting their feet underneath them. Um, with the pandemic, we have seen how urgent the situation is uh, where there's no connectivity. They do have a sense of um, how to move forward and how to, um, I mean, I'm hearing from them, they may be able to build a quarter of um, a quarter of their uh, areas out next summer if, um, if we're able to uh, provide them the additional supports. Um, these are Vermonters, dedicated Vermonters, talented Vermonters who are coming together. And so I appreciate the governor putting these funds in um, and I think it's imperative for us to keep them in um, for our economy, for healthcare, education, all of those reasons. So I guess I'll stop right there. Well, you've kind of directed us to a second thing on the list um, since you, since you kicked it off. Let's um, let's have let's move our discussion um, away from pegs um, and to um, a a second proposal in the governor's budget, which is um, for two million dollars to support um, CUDs and to be uh, explicit. And I think this um, follows from some of Commissioner Tierney's testimony on Friday, what this $2 million would be used for is it would support funding for CUDs um, as essentially equity financing that would um, be subordinated to funding that they would borrow um, to support um, construction of, um, of fiber networks, essentially, in a CUD area. It actually doesn't necessarily have to be fiber networks, but uh, likely would be. Um, so going back to X79 that we passed last year and the governor signed, um, in that bill, we stood up, I believe it's $10.8 million of VITA lending uh, that can support work by CUDs. Um, in order for CUDs to access that money, they have to put up, uh, I believe, 10% of project costs. They have to raise that money somehow. What this proposal is, is that this $2 million could be used to support CUDs uh, in raising that money. It would essentially uh, come from this, um, uh, from this funding. Um, again, this is money that is not from CRF funding. It is general funds, uh, one-time general funding, and you know, could be used not only in the next fiscal year, but um, uh, beyond that as well. So, Laura, I think your hand is up from your last question. I'm going to go to Seth now. Go ahead, Seth. Uh, I know it's a long shot and you guys have heard it before. I just want to say again that I fully support and endorse the idea of actually the state of Vermont coming to save everyone and deploying a full statewide uh, internet access rollout. I know it's not necessarily a conversation for this budget or anything, but figured it's worth saying again. So thank you. Yep. Uh, Laura, you did have your hand up? No? OK. Uh, Avram? Uh, yes. Well, f first of all, uh, yeah, if we, if, if, if we had uh, the, uh, the, the, the wherewithal and the will uh, to, to just make it so, then I would support what, um, uh, what Seth just said. I, I strongly feel we need to. Uh, um, to do this. I don't know how many times in the last few years I have had to, uh, and you've heard it from me too, uh, explain to people 
why uh, from the, uh, the description of the, um, the unserved and underserved parallel so closely uh, the reason why rural electrification happened. But on the other hand, uh, the will to make it so uh, does not uh, exist and is in fact, uh, as we heard uh, earlier, uh, prohibited in terms of states um, uh, regu regulating uh, the internet. Um, so I've been a strong supporter of, uh, of the CUDs. Um, they need uh, the resources to actually start um, uh, putting uh, fiber out to uh, places to the last mile in, in places. This will take a while, uh, but this is the only way that they, that they can get started. Uh, I represent a district with, uh, with uh, uh, two CUDs, the CV Fiber that Worcester is a member of and the newly formed Lamoille uh, uh, CUD that, uh, that Morrisville is part of. Um, so there's an awful lot of uh, interest and desire uh, in in uh, in my district um, to start actually getting this done, and 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 not rely on uh, um, short term stuff like hotspots. Uh, Representative Campbell, then Representative Chestnut Tangerman. Uh, thanks. Yes, I'm looking back at my notes from Friday, and I wrote down something about. This, this $2 million for the CUDs being, uh, possibly being the 10% equity stake to access the Vita loan money. And then I wrote where they have shovel ready projects, but, but there are few or none shovel ready projects. Can this money be spent in time? What the heck was I talking about? <laughs> so, so, I mean, I will chime in on that. Um, I mean, if this money is appropriated, um, it doesn't have to be used in the next six months or the next year. It could be used over the next two, three, four years. Um, so we'd be setting this uh, money aside for um, the department to be used um, on behalf of CUDs for this purpose. Um, because it's general fund one-time money, there's not, there's not a time, uh, there's not a fuse, if you will, on this money like CRF money. Um, in terms of it being used by CUDs and what CUDs can use it and how quickly, um, you know, there are, there are a small number of CUDs in the state that have evolved to the point in the last year where they are going to be ready in the next 12 months to actually construct projects. Um, it's just part of these organizations kind of ramping up, doing the planning work that needs to be done. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't some CUDs who, uh, who will be ready to access this money. Uh, there will be. Um, and for example, um, I know that CV Fiber had a um, Northern Borders uh, application in, uh, in the last several months that was a grant application for funding to, to essentially support them um, with equity financing to do this work because they are uh, on the cusp of, of launching um, some of that work. They did not get that grant. Um, you know, the appropriation that would uh, be included here in the governor's budget, you know, potentially that could be used to support um, a project that is ready to, to roll forward. Um, my, and, and this is a, this is a guess, but, you know, for the CUDs that have uh, ramped up and organized and come into being in the last month or two, my guess is that it will be challenging for them to access this money, to be ready to use this money in the next six to 12 months. They may well be ready to use it in you know, 18 to 24 months, but I think the more evolved C uh, CUDs will have um, you know, more opportunity to use this money closer in. That's my expectation. So there's, there's no, I guess I'm just wondering why I, I even wrote it in caps, can this money be spent in time? And I, I, I'm trying to remember what the time, you know, what the fuse was that I think June Tierney must have been talking about. And I, now, the, the, this money can be used in calendar year 2021. It can be used in calendar year 2022. Um, th th there's, yeah. not, there's not a CRF-like fuse on this money. Right. No, I understand that. I, so, but I, I still don't get why I wrote this down. Anyway, all right. Thank you. 
Uh, Robin. Thanks. Um, would this money be administered by uh, DPS? Yes. And I guess one of one of my concerns, which is a much larger picture, and and we will not come anywhere near resolving it before we have to decide on this, is um, the question of about or my concern about our emergency allocations undercutting the viability of CUDs. And, um, you know, so I, I like the support of CUDs, the frustration being that it's not immediate, the results are not immediate, the need is immediate. So if we fund short term solutions, undercutting the viability of C, CUDs potentially. Um, and I guess I just, you know, in, in there is the caution of I don't then want to throw money at a CUD that doesn't have a real future. Um, but that's not really the purview of our committee. That's the, the allocation of the funds, it seems to me. Uh, I think it's correct that, I mean, I think you're right. Ultimately, the Department of Public Service um, would control these monies and uh, ultimately make a grant, would be charged with making a grant to an applicant, a CUD, that's looking to do, um, you know, essentially project work. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Laura, did you have your hand up? Yes. Um, Robin, remember that, well, what the commissioner has brought these dollars forward for is for the match for VITA. And remember that we, that the VITA loans require business plan that makes sense. And we know that VITA, um, with the pandemic, we've heard anecdotally that VITA is um, becoming more stringent, not less stringent. And so I appreciate your concern about, you know, these funds not being used by um, CUDs that may be getting under undercut. Um, but for, we have that first safety. And the second safety of, we did, I, I share your concern about you know providers undercutting some of the CUD areas, but the dollar amounts that we put in, um, I think they can have some effect. Some providers could have some effect if they wanted to um, in undercutting the CUDs. Um, but there's really we did. I mean, we did not put in enough money to finish the job. So not even close. So. And you're muted, so I don't know if you're saying anything worth the chance. But thank you. I'm not saying anything worthwhile. I'm just muttering along. <laughs> uh, Mark, I see your hand up, and I'm going to excuse myself just a second because a plumber just knocked at my door. <laughs> um, I guess my question is, and, and maybe yeah, somebody else has the answer. Uh, how many CUDs are currently in Vermont now? What's the, what's the total number? Mark, I believe the answer is nine. Um, it could be 10. There is a map that Rob Fish um, keeps updated that is on the um, Department of Public Service website. And so you'll see study areas on there and then you'll see colors um, that each town um, is colored if they're part of a certain study area, CUD or a CUD. Um, and he updates that as more towns vote to join the CUDs. And I have to tell you, if you have not seen that map recently, you should. Um, you should look at it. It's really inspiring to see how Vermonters have been answering um, this challenge and, and trying to work on this. So I guess my, my question is, um, out of that $2 million for the CUDs that really aren't up and running completely yet, is there, is there a limit as to the amount um, that any one CD, CUD can request and receive? Is there, so so there's, is it there's first, no, first, first come, yeah. first serve? Yeah, I think it's first come, first serve. There's no language in... Um, the governor's budget, and that's certainly our purview. 
I mean, if, if we wanted to put language in there, um, you know, directing that this money be used in a certain way, um, you know, that is very much in our wheelhouse. There is no language in the governor's budget that says, you know, a CUD couldn't come in and make a request for $2 million. Um, I, I don't think that's the case, uh, just practically speaking. I think that, um, you know, again, this $2 million would go to support, call it 10% of a project cost. So if a CUD came in and made an application for, let's say, um, $400,000, that would be to support a project that would be a $4 million project. Um, you know, there would, they would be looking for this $400,000 grant in order to get $3.6 million of uh, debt financing. So this isn't just for $2 million of projects. This is, you know, for more like $20 million of projects. Right. So, so again, I guess my concern or, or for a conversation is, should there be some, maybe based on the size as well, but some limit to uh, the amount so that the ones that are just starting out can eventually count on some, some of that grant money uh, going forward. Um, I, I, again, I, I, I feel it's a little unfair that, you know, there's been some of these CDs up and running for some time now, and they, they definitely do have a, a leg up uh, in regards to projects that they're, they're considering. Yep, I, I think it's a point well taken. Um, and again, I, you know, our committee, the Appropriations Committee, the Senate, we had, we're, we're the ones who are writing this budget. So we have the purview to say that, you know, no CUD could, you know, access this $2 million by more than fill in the blank, $400,000. Um, so that this could be available to at least um, five CUDs. And, you know, in two years, we'd have to potentially come back and provide more money. I, I, again, Mark, I think your point is well taken. It's, you know, the, you know, we, ha we have kind of blue ocean here to, to, to put constraints on this money that we'd want. Um, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to chime in here just because I haven't had a chance to speak on this and, and throw an idea or two out to the committee. And again, I, I've, I've spoken to um, uh, the, the chair of the appropriations committee and acknowledge their excruciating task of kind of sifting through, you know, all these um, priorities across, uh, across the whole budget. Um, and also acknowledging, frankly, her prioritization of CUD work um, in her area in particular, there's, there's real need for better connectivity. And, you know, a question that I have in terms of, um, or, or maybe it's a proposal that I have in terms of uh, supporting $2 million of funding here. Um, one is, one question concern that I have about this money, which I uh, tried to articulate on Friday, which is, is this the highest and best use of money for CUDs? I think for some CUDs, it absolutely is. And I think those are the CUDs that are most evolved and um, have the, you know, the ability in the next certainly 12 months, maybe 18 months to do uh, project work, which is what this money would be used for. Um, I think there's other CUDs who are not gonna be ready to do that work, who are gonna have other higher best use um, for, for funds. And uh, one question I have, and I wouldn't put it in the form of a proposal, but do we wanna put more flexibility into how this money can be used? Uh, because for some CUDs, um, they're gonna have other uses that um, are really going to be necessary for them to take on and fund and get done before they can actually even access this money. And we want to accelerate this work around the, the, the state. That's one question I have. The other is, um, and I don't know if this is possible, but giving the or recommending the flexibility for the Appropriations Committee, um, if some of this money can be used in the very near term, and again, I uh, uh, made mention of CV Fiber that had made a um, grant application that was turned down. Um, clearly, they have work that be, can be done in the near term in this regard. Uh, a question that I have is, can we potentially fund um, a portion of this money out of general fund, uh, one-time money, um, say $1.5 million, 
and allocate $500,000 um, instead of out of general fund one-time money from CRF money if we are convinced, A, that it would qualify for CRF, um, uh, it would qualify for CRF under CRF criteria, and two, that it can be used quickly. Because again, my understanding is that there are some CUDs who can put this money to work uh, in the much uh, nearer term. And if we can give the Appropriations Committee some wiggle room to use some of this $2 million in the one-time general fund appropriation, uh, but if we de determine that some of this money can be used in the near term and draw down under CRF, um, that would be something that I'd like to give them the flexibility to do. Uh, Robin. Uh, this is going back before to, to Mark's concerns and, um, and just wondering if one of the uh, conditions in there to consider might be, um, you know, a, a uh, allocation of in, in diverse geographical regions of the state. So it's not all going to one CUD or, or two, but distributed with, with uh, with not strict parameters, but that as a, a guideline. And it's not a recommendation, it's a thought I'm throwing out there. Yeah, I, just thinking out loud, I wonder if that would be served by saying that a, uh, an individual CUD could not draw down more than X amount of this $2 million. Just, just a thought. Uh, go ahead, Avram. Uh, I just I, I wanted to uh, put my two cents in that I I, uh, I could support um, a, some flexibility in use of these funds, as you're suggesting, with the recognition that that uh, there are um, some CUDs that that can actually start putting fiber out on back roads uh, almost immediately, and there are others. Uh, that are uh, that are just formed and are not ready uh, yet. Uh, also, I'm going to be uh, emailing you all the uh, the two Worcester representatives on the CV Fiber uh, Board uh, put out an update on our front porch forum yesterday that I'll, I'll share with you because some of what we're talking about um, is kind of reflected in in uh, in their report. Scott? So I guess I'm wondering whether there are any projects that really could be done in the next three months. Um, it seems, seems impossible to me, unless the, the projects are already rolling. Um, so I, I mean, I'm in favor of flexibility, and, and, but I'm just, it just seems like a real long shot that there's anything that could be done by December 30th, whatever the deadline is. Um, yeah, on the other, on the other hand, I'm thinking, about, I'm thinking about flexibility for other purposes. Um, the Vita loan um, authority was for uh, $10.8 million. It was, it was in Act 79, um, thinking, thinking that that would fund $12 million worth of, worth of uh, expansion, worth of uh, uh, plant. Um, so $2 million is more than 10% of that. Um, presumably the 2 million, you know, that, that, if that was intended for, for equity financing, uh, then um, that could be equity financing for other sources of loans. But maybe giving uh, the flexibility to use some of that money for infrastructure building, uh, that is CUD infrastructure building, administrative infrastructure building um, would be a good thing too. So that, that's another vote for flexibility from what I hear. Um, yes. Laura? Yeah, I, so in order, I, I have been keeping good contact with the CUDs. They have actually also formed an association where they're talking about, you know, what are the next steps for themselves? Um, and I, there are projects that they can do that various CUDs can do that we have not yet funded 
before December 20th. Um, some of the work that is critical that Tim was referencing in order for them to borrow this money that this 2 million is for in order to build next summer. So there right now we have a window where we can help them um, the flexibility um, I think would be well served in helping helping get those projects done so that this money can then be implemented next summer. And um, this two million uh, that's leveraging for the um, for Vita that yes, it's more than what we have right now um, at Vita, but what we have at Vita, at some point we will need to, you know, we will need to examine whether or not um, we're going to need to put more put more borrowing capacity there. We'll try to put more borrowing capacity there as more and more CUDs um, grow and expand. So yeah, but I will also say that that this um, this equity financing could support borrowing outside of uh, Vita. Um, I mean, I happen to live uh, in a um, CUD catchment area where they had no Vita financing. They accessed debt dollars other 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 places and had to raise equity financing. This could be used to support that kind of thing. Laura, I had a question for you because you have followed this so closely. Um, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Um, one thing that I had brought up was, is it possible to try and squeeze some of this $2 million out of additional CRF monies, um, if it could be used in time, um, assuming that the, the time constraints are not um, loosened. And I thought I heard you say that, yes, it could be, but I, again, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I want to, I want to hear your, and I'll ask this question of, of the CUDs when they come in on Thursday. Yes, um, that is my understanding. Um, and I think we're probably going to hear from them on Thursday um, about what it is that they feel that they can do uh, with some urgency that they need to do in order to build next summer, in order to um, borrow these funds. So the poll, poll survey data, which we really struggled with, whether when we did the original allocation of CRF dollars, you remember this, Mr. Chair, you know, we didn't know if they could use it for that, if it would be done in time. And as they keep moving along and developing and developing and developing, um, you know, we have several CUDs that could do that work and they believe they could do that work prior to uh, the CRF deadline, which will then allow these funds, which are not CRF funds, to be implemented next year. So yes, the flexibility, I think, would work here. I think it is possible for us to, if there are CRF funds available, perhaps reduce this a little um, or, or give that flexibility to the Appropriations Committee. Yep. Okay. Um, I see two more hands up, uh, Mark and then Scott. So my understanding is these VITA funds, these loans are that, they're loans. And so there's going to be continuing money. This $10.8 million isn't going to all of a sudden vanish in a few years, correct? That's right. Okay. And, and the other thing is um, VITA anticipated a, an amount of loss. And I can't remember what that was, but do you have that figure? I, I don't have it on top of mind, but um, there is a very specific figure associated with that that was actually incorporated into Act 79. Um, so this, that number was, uh, I believe it was an appropriated amount based on an expectation for, you know, here are what loan losses um, would be projected to be from a program like this. I'm thinking it was one point something million, but I, I may be off. 540,000. Okay. So okay. That, that sounds an awful lot like 5%, but okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, who is next, Scott? It was me. What were they going to ask? Uh, oh, I know, about, about what's eligible for CRF money. Um, should, we have, should we have somebody in who can talk about that, about eligibility? I mean, I know we've d done that before, but I, I guess I, uh, I, I, I'm, uh, Laura mentioned uh, using the money for, for a, um, what did you call it, a poll, a poll study. Um, uh, is, is that eligible for CRF, really? Since it, would, it, would, it wouldn't actually um, 
you know, put anything in place. It would just be preparation for putting something in place. Uh, so there were a couple of questions there. I think one was directed at me, which is, should we get more visibility from our CRF experts on whether you know some of this would qualify? Um, I, I would, I would say absolutely. Um, you know, the question is, is how much of that work we're going to be able to do with our limited committee time between now and the time we're going to have to make a recommendation to the appropriations committee. I will tell you that, you know, you know, this budget process, we are building the plane as it's rolling down the runway. And how I see this is we are going to have to, in the next 24 hours, make our best recommendations to the appropriations committee. And I've already told this to some members of the appropriations committee, where we may be coming back to them at the end of the week saying we've got additional feedback we want to give you on this CR, you know this CUD um, uh, reflection. Also, this is going to go to the Senate and it's going to be worked on over there and it's going to come back and we're going to have additional recommendations. I think you know it's not ideal, but I think we have to do our best work uh, as quickly as we can knowing that this is a work in process. Um, this is not our last word on this. And um, again, we're going to be taking testimony on Thursday on this stuff. Um, so that, that's the best I got for you at this point. Okay. But yes, we do need to hear from yeah, more. I'm just, I'm just wondering about getting getting somebody who's you know we I, the state or or uh, JFO or somebody has uh, retained a consultant who, to, to to give us advice about what qualifies for CRF and it's actually the governor's office has oh, okay. a uh, consultant that's working with them on all CRF recommendations. So yes, absolutely. Just worried about clawback, that's all. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. Um, so uh, I would like to move on to um, another on our list of items here. Um, another, this is an issue. It is not a recommendation in the governor's budget, but it has brought, been brought to us as an issue. And there's a little history to share um, with the committee on this. And that relates to funding for telecom planning. So back in February, this committee supported uh, and made a recommendation to the Appropriations Committee um, to fund $300,000 for telecom planning. It was a request that was in the governor's budget. Um, it was in the Department of Public Service. It was something that we supported that recommendation. Um, when all bets were off after COVID hit, um, you know, it certainly came to our understanding, even though we didn't finish a budget, that the Senate was interested in more money for telecom planning, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $800,000 for a uh, broader, more comprehensive um, telecom plan. Um, some of the work that this committee did um, and that the Senate supported back in June um, was that we got the blessing to um, put $500,000 of coronavirus relief fund money toward telecom planning um, with the specificity that it would relate to um, some of the challenges that we have been dealing with in the COVID crisis and also that that initial $500,000 towards telecom planning would be essentially setting the table for a more complete 10-year telecom plan that we would be completed with general fund dollars of $300,000 that would be put into the FY21 budget. That was, you know, I don't want to say there was an agreement on that, but that was, I think, the concept that um, certainly I was thinking through, and I think other folks were as well. Um, when the governor's FY21 budget came out, there was not $300,000 of funding for additional telecom planning. So at this point, what is, um, you know, before the legislature, if, you know, we choose to go down this path is, you know, whether or not we should look for, um, ask the Appropriations Committee to find $300,000 of one-time general fund money, this is not CRF money, but general fund money to support um, additional telecom planning. And, um, you know, again, that is, you know, that's a concept that's before us. Um, so, I, you know, I'll, I'll lead off the discussion on this since I've kind of set the table as to, you know, where we are on this issue right now, which is, um, 
this is, you know, this is funding, this $300,000 of general fund appropriation money is something that this committee has historically supported. It was in our um, budget letter to the Appropriations Committee back in um, February. And my view on this right now is that, um, uh, you know, I, as with almost any program, you know, more money would be helpful uh, to getting this done. Um, but, I, you know, I think we've gone to the mat in trying to get $500,000 um, through the Coronavirus Relief Fund um, uh, dollars to support this. Uh, I, I wouldn't be shy about asking if the Appropriations Committee can find $300,000 of one-time money um, to support this. It would be certainly something that our committee has supported in the past. But personally, you know, relative to some of these other priorities, this falls down um, farther on the list because of the money we've already gotten to support this kind of work. So I don't want to say that I'm not supportive of it, but um, if ultimately we are going to be making a priority based recommendation to the Appropriations Committee, you know, this is an area where I could see, um, you know, deprioritizing relative to some of these other things. So that's my top of mind. Um, uh, I see Heidi's hand up. Go ahead, Heidi. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, I'm just, um, just to go back to this conversation, because it, it sounded, again, like they were, um, that it was going to be done. Um, regardless of if we had the $300,000 appropriation. And I think um, I'll just say at this time, I realize that this is something that we have supported in the past, but um, it's a different world out there. And um, a lot of people are stepping up doing things uh, for which they're not being paid for, um, <laughs> uh, or they're, they're just doing twice the job uh, that, they, that they used to be doing. And, that's it both in my business and in the private sector and in the, in the public sector. I, I, I'm, sh you know, if they, this is just a different world. I just, I just feel like we need to look at again, a, a, a bigger universe. So that's just, there's a lot of sacrifices being made right now on a lot of fronts in a lot of families, in a lot of businesses. Um, and um, so I'm just, just trying to put that in, in perspective here. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Um, I see two more hands up, uh, Robin and then Mike. Um, I'm wondering if anybody can help me with understanding what do we get for 500,000 versus what we get for 800,000? Uh, I can only speak to that at a very high level. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you what we get from it from a budgetary perspective. Uh, we get federal money versus state <laughs> one-time money. Right. Um, but that's, that's more of a flip answer. Um, my understanding, and I think this was included in uh, written testimony that we got, or maybe it was um, offered verbally um, from the Department of Public Service, that they were in the process of, and maybe even have, as of today, hired a consultant to do that first five hundred thousand dollars of work. And I say first five hundred thousand dollars of work, you know, that assumes that there's more money coming after that, um, and that that work would need to be completed uh, by December. And that, um, and I'd have to go back and look at it's it's in statute what that work was to be focused on, because I think that there was a focus on, um, you know, some of the telecom shortcomings in our state that specifically relate to the COVID emergency, because that's how it qualified for CRF funding. But I don't think I'm speaking out of school to say that the work done as part of that study would set the table for um, kind of the completion of the plan that would be presented to the legislature I can't remember if it was April, there was a deadline, um, but in April or May of uh, 2021. So I, I know that's not a specific answer as you're looking for, Robin. Um, if we go back and look at 966, it does give some specific, uh, specific criteria as to what has to be done by December. I'll, I'll look at 966 more closely. Um, I, I just also have sort of a, a gut reaction to uh, $800,000 for a plan. 
no, you know. Well, I'll go back to what our committee's <laughs> recommendation was for, which is yeah. for three hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, um, I, I'm not saying that that more resources won't result in a better plan. Um, we can quibble about that. But um, our committee's recommendation was for three hundred thousand dollars here. I think the Senate wanted to see more money, and I think how we kind of split the, you know, um, split the difference was finding money in CRF to support this, with the idea that there would be additional money, one-time money. And um, I share some of Heidi's concerns in that, you know, it's harder to come by that general fund one-time money in this place. And we might have to either make do with the money we've gotten through CRF or look to um, the Department of Public Service to kind of put the finishing touches on a plan using the, um, you know, the, the work that's done by a consultant in the next five months, four months um, as a springboard for that work. Okay. So, um, Mike? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry I uh, got in here kind of late. Uh, I just uh, I didn't even know about this meeting until I got a text from Scott. Uh, so I apologize for that. And uh, I don't know if you could give me an overview of what we're talking about. Uh, I know we're discussing uh, funding. I, I'd be happy to after we're done, Mike, but okay. we just have limited time. So it's, um, but we are basically discussing five um, potential recommendations that we would make to the Appropriations Committee. Um, and there are things that were in the governor's budget with the exception of this one, which is re related to the telecom plan, um, but include the two, $2 million for CUD funding, uh, $100,000 for the PEG um, uh, funding study, um, $1.2 million for uh, DMV work on the new stickering technology and um, something else. <laughs> so at any rate, but, but Mike, I'd be happy to spend time with you after, but we're kind of going through each of these proposals. We've gone through three of them now. And at the end of our discussion, um, we're gonna start putting together um, our prioritization for some of these things and how we might bring them forward. Right. Um, are, are there any other thoughts on this currently not in the budget, $300,000 um, telecom plan question. Any other things that people want to offer? Again, we're going to come back to this at the end of our discussion. Um, the next thing I want to move to relates to um, telecom, excuse me, to um, Wi-Fi hotspots. And again, there's some history on this that I think is important for the committee to um, understand as we consider this recommendation. Um, roughly speaking, the Department of Public Service, and again, these are rough numbers, um, this spring spent approximately, I'm going to say $175,000 on Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, it was the understanding that some of that money would be reimbursed to the Department of Public Service um, through a FEMA application. Um, there was an expectation that uh, the Department of Public Service would be reimbursed uh, for about $125,000 of that expenditure. Um, the remaining expenditure, we gave the Department of Public Service the ability to draw down on up to $50,000 of CRF funds. This was in section 13 of H-966. So um, we gave in H-966 the, um, the department the ability to draw down up to $50,000 to um, uh, basically to pay for uh, those expenditures with the understanding that they would likely be reimbursed for the other, call it $125,000 through a FEMA application. That FEMA application did not come through. Um, so at this juncture, that $125,000 would essentially um, come out of uh, the department's budget. And um, I think it's fair to say that there's very little room in the department's budget to, uh, to cover that expense. Um, 
one of the uh, a proposal that has come to um, and it was included in the governor's budget was to uh, ask for an additional um, one hundred and twenty five thousand um, dollars out of the CRF funding um, to pay for this um, expenditure. And uh, I'm looking for this. It's in Section B, 1104 in the governor's budget. Um, and it's under the Coronavirus Relief Fund. It's one-time funding um, for uh, the department for $125,000. And it says for the purpose of installing Wi-Fi hotspots, it sounds like that work is yet to occur. It's actually work that's already occurred, um, to be clear. This isn't, this isn't money for future Wi-Fi hotspots it's to um, reimburse the department for work already completed. I think it's pretty clear that this qualifies for CRF funding. Um, one of the, uh, so that was the proposal. Um, another way, if you will, to, to skin this cat or to skin this bird, Mike, um, I'm looking at your bird, <laughs> um, is to give the department flexibility under um, H-966. Again, this funding is allowed in um, Section 13. Section 13 um, provides $17,466,500 for a variety of things. Um, if the department would uh, be acceptable in increasing that $50,000, to $175,000 to give them the flexibility to use up to that amount uh, for reimbursement on the Wi-Fi hotspot work that has been done. Um, I've talked to the commissioner about that and, um, and uh, have emailed members of the Appropriations Committee, um, the chair and Representative Feltis about this. So that is another way to do this and um, acceptable to um, the commissioner. The reason they would have the flexibility to do that is because not all of that $17,466,500 has been specifically allocated to um, certain programs. Um, you know, up to $2 million of that amount of money could be used for line extensions. Um, uh, I think the bulk of that money is going to be used for connectivity initiative um, opportunities. Um, but there is flexibility uh, with which the department can allocate that funding. Um, what I would suggest we do is give um, additional flexibility for the department to use that money to um, reimburse for these Wi-Fi hotspots. But the, again, there are a couple of different ways we could, we could go at this. So that's some history on this issue. Um, and again, I'm just bringing the committee up to speed on conversations I've had with Commissioner Tierney and with members of the Appropriations Committee as to how we might solve this kind of funding question request. Any thoughts or questions on this? Oh. Uh, Robin? Uh, I like the, the latter idea of increasing the flexibility for DPS to take it out of money already allocated for connectivity. Um, because, I mean, hotspots are connectivity. To me, it, the, you know, it, it is appropriate use of those funds under the bigger umbrella. Yep. Um, Scott? Um, just want to chime in and say, I like it too. Let's do that. OK. Um, I, I've actually. Uh, well, actually, I'll give Representative Feltis um, credit for it. She's asked Maria to, to um, draft up language that would um, support this. Literally, it's changing the number in Section 13 from $50,000 of reimbursement to $175,000 reimbursement. So it's not a real heavy lift from a drafting perspective. Um, so, uh, OK. If there's not any other questions on that, I think the last thing that we would turn to on my list, again, just for general conversation, is the um, <clears throat> is the uh, 
governor's request for $1.2 million of money for the Department of Motor Vehicles. Again, this is getting a little bit outside our lane, I will say, but um, this is something that ADS would work on. And since we had the advantage of having them in committee last week, I thought we'd ask them about that. this. And um, I think the Appropriations Committee would you know, welcome if we have any thoughts on this. Um, I did want the committee to know that I alerted the leadership on the transportation, the House Transportation Committee um, over the weekend of the testimony that we took on this. And I referred them to our YouTube testimony so that they could watch it for themselves. Um, and also, uh, you know, let them know that we're not trying to get outside of our lane here and into the DMV world, but, um, you know, just from an ADS perspective, we were interested in this. Uh, the feedback I got from them, you know, for the for the committee's uh, um, situational awareness is is that they are unequivocally supportive of this program. This is something that they are going to recommend, uh, I believe, to the appropriations committee. Um, so, uh, you know, again, we heard the testimony that we heard on Friday, and I will also say that. You know, I sense that ADS is very supportive of this program from an efficiency perspective, both on the administrative side and on the enforcement side. Um, I also heard from committee members, um, you know, some questions about, is this uh, kind of 1990s technology in a, you know, 2020 world? Um, personally, I can't speak to this technology. It's not something I know a whole lot about. Um, I do take what the, what the uh, secretary provided us in terms of te testimony about the uh, efficiency upgrade here, both administratively and from an enforcement perspective. But um, again, I couldn't tell you the first thing about the world of DMV stickering. So um, as I said, I'm a little outside of my world there. Um, are there, are there thoughts and uh, questions on this? Yeah, if I can just speak up, uh, I'm sure there's yeah. a lot of folks out there would appreciate no stickers at all. So there you go. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, <laughs> I'm no license place either. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, I don't know. I, again, you know, is this a time? Is this a time for spending one point two million dollars? I don't know. I, I didn't, I didn't see the urgent need that this is going to save a lot of money or create a, you know, or solve a huge problem that there is out there. So, this is again one that I could, I could put at the bottom of the list. A um, couple more hands up, uh, Scott, and then Mike. Well, I feel the same way. I mean, I just, I, I guess I'm puzzled why between a likeness plate number and a VIN number, we need stickers at all. I, I just, I, so I'd, I guess I'd like to hear what the enforcement angle is, is on it. But obviously that's, you know, that's not really our purview. So um, I don't know. It, it, it before I would feel comfortable uh, recommending it above in other uh, expenditures, I'd want to know more about why we can't get away from stickers at all. Mike? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> just on the Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, totally in favor of that. Um, I know that we're looking to put some Wi-Fi hotspots for folks in Charlotte that uh, don't have adequate internet access. Are the stickers, uh, we're talking about the uh, inspection stickers or the little tags that go on your license plate. Which stickers we talked about there? I, I'm assuming it was the inspection stickers. Yeah, I'm, I, I think that we need them. Uh, how else do you know whether the car's been inspected or not? What computers are for? Yeah, uh, Avram? I can make a sticker and stick it in my window that'll say that it, it's approved, been approved. You know, I could make one pretty easy, but just to, you know, just an idea. Mm, not sure about that point. Uh, Avram? You're muted, Avram. That's the first time I've been, had to be reminded of that. Thank you. Um, first time in a while, anyway. Um, in terms of uh, the uh, the sticker thing, I you know I also I don't know uh, 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 enough about this. I don't think this 
I don't see this as a priority for our committee. I don't think we should um, oppose it, if, especially if we know that, uh, that the more relevant uh, committee that knows, presumably knows more about all of this is very enthusiastic about it. So I, I don't want to, I'm not suggesting that we um, uh, uh, oppose it. I'm just saying that this is not compared to other things on, on, on this list, larger and smaller. Uh, it, this is not a priority for me, and I suggest that that's uh, we, we we find a way to to say that, not oppose it, um, but uh, we we have, we have other things on the list that are higher priorities. Well, well uh, you know, along those lines, um, I'm the only reason I am neutral on this is because I don't know enough about it. it this is not at all my area of expertise. I I know enough about the DMV from my five minutes of interaction there annually as I go to renew my whatever, my registration. So I, I don't feel um, qualified to make uh, a, uh, a recommendation as to whether this is a good uh, DMV program or not. Um, again, I think we took testimony on this because we had the advantage of having ADS in here um, this is a program that is being funded through DMV. Um, you know, some of the Laura, some of the uh, questions that Laura had last week. You know, why isn't this funded through ADS? Um, you know, this is work that DMV um, has made a determination. Um, you know, along with the governor's recommended um, budget, that this is a priority. Um, I, my, I think where I'm leaning on this is is where Avram is going, which is. Um, either no recommendation or um, it, because I don't think we're qualified. I'll speak for myself. I don't think I'm qualified to speak to um, what DMV program should receive prioritization and um, instead stick to the um, prioritizing of other recommendations where I think we do have um, you know, more uh, experience as policymakers. So I'd be inclined to, to leave this either off our list or kind of on the bottom of our list. Uh, Robin, I see your hand up. Um, yeah, I also get to speak from a position of vast ignorance on this topic. Um, but my general impression is from the last several months, uh, there are so many areas in DMV that need to be brought up to speed, computerized, made more accessible. Um, and I'm not in a position to say which, what, which of those should be prioritized. Um, and in light of that, sort of uncomfortable backing this one as a priority. So I'm inclined to, to go uh, along with what you and Avram were talking about. Um, but, but I think DMV needs a makeover <laughs> a rethink top to bottom rather than lipstick well, I can on the say pig, from, a, from a firsthand perspective, something I do have expertise on is um, people getting their driver's licenses, which has been a real challenge in my household in the last two months is I've got two teenagers who have been trying to get their driver's tests. Uh, although it saved a lot of money for me in the insurance world uh, in that regard that slowed them down. But uh, that aside, um, Let's use this as a jumping off point. Um, and again, I don't want to uh, I, I don't want to get in the way of kind of recommendations from members. But, um, you know, as we consider these five things, I would say that we um, maybe only refer to the DMV recommendation parenthetically, that um, it's something that we heard testimony on um, that, you know, from a policy perspective, it's not in our committee's purview to, um, you know, look at prioritization of programs in in uh, in DMV and leave it to the transportation committee to make their recommendation. Um, if that is acceptable to people, I'd like to turn back um, to the other four programs um, and start to craft what our recommendations are on these four things, um, you know, potentially prioritizing or potentially, um, you know, not necessarily putting them in order. But Mike, just to bring you up to speed, those four things are 
the $2 million one-time funding for CUDs. It's general fund money in the governor's budget. Um, it's the uh, $125,000 for um, CRF, uh, um, excuse me, it's the $125,000 for Wi-Fi hotspots. That would be CRF funds. Um, that's the second one. The third one is, do we ask for $300,000 for um, telecom planning money? That would be general fund one time. And then the final one is, um, there's a $100,000 uh, $100, request in the governor's budget for the, for the PEG uh, study, which is, um, was required as part of H966, but not funded. Um, through ACCD. So those are the four things. And I'd like to have the committee start to kind of hone in on a recommendation. And, and the one caveat I will say, particularly with regard to the $2 million um, of CUD funding is um, I expect to whatever conclusion this committee comes to today, it is not gonna be the final word on that program. I think there's gonna be a lot of discussion on this in the next couple of weeks. Again, in an imperfect world where we don't have an infinite amount of time, I think we've got to you know, do the best we can with the idea that we are going to continue to revise these recommendations through the appropriations process in so the next all, one, two, three weeks. This is all general fund money and not, not CRF money? Uh, no, the $125,000 for Wi-Fi hotspots is CRF money. Okay. Um, and yeah, that is the only thing that is CRF money per, per the governor's uh, budget recommendations. So. But Tim, um, we had... uh, go ahead, Laura, and then Mark. Uh, we had talked about possibly uh, some flexibility, suggesting uh, looking at some flexibility at the two million, right? That was a suggestion I made. That, that, that was not the governor's um, suggestion. Right. That was that was something I threw out there for our for our committee to to chew on. Um, and I certainly don't want to speak for the appropriations committee. I know that they would, if if that's possible to do. I know that they would probably breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief on that. But um, th th that's a that's a place we could go there. Um, I mean, so if we're looking at, um, you know, if we're looking at issues for, you know, for this year, um, even, you know, I mean, it seems like we could probably reduce, um, reduce that uh, million for VITA and in order to get to the VITA, they're going to need some dollars for um, additional work to be done. That additional work, I think, a lot of it can be done prior to the CRF deadline. So we could pivot over to CRF there. So we could reduce potentially the governor, governor's recommendation on general funds and see if there's some CRF available to, so that we can make sure we leverage those. Okay. I mean, again, that is something that I would like to do if we, if we can do and something that I would like to recommend, which is reduce the general fund recommendation there to 1.5 and uh, see if we could bridge that gap to get us to the governor's $2 million by using $500,000 of CRF money, if we can do that. So um, Mark, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you're looking for a stop time at uh, three here, but would it help you for us to do our prioritizing one through five and then you, analyze them all and put them in a, in a, at least for now, and then go back to talking about them? Um, because it, it, so one thing I uh, am perfectly capable of and would love to do is to have your proxy in giving <laughs> you guys, you, you all giving me your priorities and then me kind of putting it together. Um, I, I don't want to take that, I, I don't know if that's, it's not appropriate. What, um, so thank you for, for drawing the attention to the clock, Mark. Um, we have the ability to, um, at people's convenience, obviously, to, to carve out an hour to have more discussion on this tomorrow. Um, as you know, the, the speaker's office every week gives us 
prescribed times in which we can meet. Um, I have asked her if we need to, can we get another hour tomorrow to meet? Um, so, you know, again, we can use a few more minutes today to kind of kick this around. And if people want to kind of email me their, you know, priorities and suggestions, I can pull that together and, um, you know, come up with a committee proposal, if you will, tomorrow that we can kind of look at a little more generally, so to speak, well, and then I, make a final recommendation. I, I just think that would be a good starting point, Tim. I mean, you know, yeah. if some, somebody's going to have to take in it, you know, it's generally you and that's fine, but a lead on, you yep. know, what's, what's the top priority. So, yep. um, and, and I, as far as the time goes, I mean, for me, um, we're, we're meeting on the floor at two, correct? Uh, tomorrow we are meeting on the floor at two o'clock, correct? Okay, so, so for me, if we're looking for another hour, you know, 12.30 to 1.30 would be the best for me so that I can at least get in a half a day. Okay. Rather than, um, rather than 10 in the morning. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Um, let's circle back to that. I wanna hear from Avram more quickly and then, and then Laura as well. So go ahead. Uh, just a comment on the, uh, the, the $2 million and the possibility that, uh, that it, that we could use CRF funds for projects that could be uh, uh, completed in, 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 in that time frame, And I agree, we, we should. My concern is um, we don't know whether, whether that will actually happen or not. So I'm, I feel reluctant in reducing uh, the 2 million by a like amount. If I would rather see if we can keep that amount and if uh, we can get some of the work done uh, before the end of the year with the CRF money, then, then we would not need to, uh, we would say we would then, then uh, uh, take that out of the $2 million and not spend the whole thing. Uh, I'm I mean, just worried that, go ahead, I'm done. Yeah, well, I was just gonna say, there's certainly a way to, to incorporate this into our um, recommendation if that was the way we were to go, Avram. And I think we could present that to the Appropriations Committee in the context of, that there is absolutely two million dollars of need, uh, if not significantly more, in the uh, communications union district community. Um, you know, if we can support that in general fund money, that's terrific. If we can um, use five hundred thousand dollars as a starting point um, out of CRF money to support some of that work uh, in the near term, we would recommend using that amount of money in CRF dollars um, in addition to one and a half month. Hundred and a half million dollars of general fund money, um, but again, giving the appropriations committee the, the the flexibility while acknowledging the priority here, that if 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 we can deduce, you know, again, we're we're building the plane here as it's going down the runway. If we can deduce that five hundred thousand dollars of money um, that we're talking about here could be used in the very near term and would qualify for CRF use, take it out of that. Um, instead of uh, general fund one-time money, which is, I mean, that's platinum plated money in, in this budget. Um, so at any rate, I, I think that's something we could in, in, incorporate into a recommendation. Um, Laura? So can I, can I just take a, so I'm hearing that we may want to meet tomorrow. We may want to, but I'm going to, if, if it's okay with you, I would love to just take a stab yeah. and see if, see if there's possibly agreement and if there's not we could meet tomorrow so here is what i would suggest so what if we were to include in our it's not even a memo is it is it an email it's an um, email yeah um so the 125 for the wi-fi hotspots because those did not qualify for fema um so they've got to get paid for um 300k for the telecom plan um because the that was something that the Senate felt really, you know, like let's let's let the Senate have something. Uh, the peg study, 100K, and uh, let's leave the two million in for the um, for the equity financing and um, have you? I mean, it sounds like you've spoken with Marty. You've spoken with the chair about, you know, possibility for um, flexibility of CRF funds, and you've said to us that we're we're all going to need to be flexible as this is moving. But is that something that the committee could get behind? And and 
I'm fully prepared for the answer to be no, but I'm also happy not to meet tomorrow if the answer is yes. I, I think where, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I, I think where I'm not entirely on the same page is with regard to the, um, the telecom planning. And again, I would say that in a perfect world, we would have more money and more time to put towards those planning, you know, to, towards that planning effort. Um, again, I'm just looking at historically what our committee has supported with regard to telecom planning. And I think we've exceeded that in the support we put behind the CRF funding. Um, and, you know, we've got a little, we've got to leave a little meat on the bone for the Senate to ask for. And, you know, if, if this is a priority for them to, to, to get even more, then um, I, I wouldn't want to step in the way of the heroic work that they would do. Um, so, uh, you know, is it something I could support? Yes. Is it something that of these four things that we would make recommendations on, I would probably put it as number four. Uh, yeah. I don't know that I think we need it either. Again, Senate. And I would also remind you that this is something that is not currently in the budget. This is something that we would have to, you know, basically hammer into a budget that, that it's not money that's currently in there. Unlike any of these other, other things that we're, um, that we're talking about. So, um, any other thoughts on prioritization and or meeting tomorrow? Um, I, I guess what I would say with regard to meeting tomorrow is, um, I had personally, I have a hard stop at one o'clock. So I would suggest that if we're going to meet tomorrow, that we meet at, at noon sharp, um, and to facilitate the quick work that we would do, I would, um, ask that members share with me, um, just an email form doesn't have to be long, your thoughts on these different programs. And I will try and conform that into what I think is a consensus proposal. And that's what we'll start talking about at noon. Um, and, you know, who knows if we'll have to vote on each line item. We've done that before. But that, that might be the easiest thing just to bring us to consensus. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry to impose on folks, uh, but you might have to give up your lunch uh, tomorrow. Or, or why don't you bring your lunch to committee? I'll say that. And, uh, and we can do that then. Um, but again, I want to give we, people the opportunity. Will noon work for people tomorrow? And, and Danielle, I don't know if you can hear us uh, at this point. I don't even know if you're available. <laughs> I'm here. Yes, I am available tomorrow at noon. OK. Um, Robin? Uh, I just want to point out to Heidi that we will all have our lunches with us at noon tomorrow, and we'll all have our cameras on, and she's welcome <laughs> to join us. <laughs> That's right. No, no, thanks. <laughs> uh, I, like to eat, I like to eat by myself. <laughs> so you were brought up so properly. <laughs> um, okay, so again, your, your homework uh, is um, take a few minutes, uh, hopefully in the next six hours, um, to send me an email um, with thoughts on prioritization here. Um, and I will consolidate those thoughts to be kind of the starting point for our conversation at noon. Again, I've got a hard stop at probably, uh, you know, 1257, because I've got another meeting I've got to go to. Um, but the goal will be to come out of that discussion tomorrow with, here's our recommendation to the Appropriation Committee. So I um, appreciate everyone's time today um, in digging into this and your thoughts uh, uh, overnight. And um, Danielle, if you could send us out an invitation, a Zoom invitation for tomorrow at noon, that would be great. And just, you can post this on our committee agenda as committee discussion um, for budget recommendations. Okay, will do. Okay. All righty, thanks everybody. <laughs>